Our next speaker this morning is Brian Wandel. Um, he's the first Isaac and Madeline Stein family professor in psychology at Stanford. Brian is the founding director of Stanford's Center for Cognitive and Neurobiological Imaging, and he's the deputy director of Stanford Neuroscience Institute. His research centers on vision science and uses functional, structural, and quantitative magnetic resonance imaging along with behavior testing and computational modeling to understand the action of the visual portions of the brain. Thanks, Amy. Morning, everybody, and thanks, Christine, for that nice presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about a specific instance of uh, data management and, and then the general issue of uh, how we think about neuro, uh, how we think about neuroimaging data in, in particular. I, I don't know, uh, Christine did a very nice job in uh, offering a broad view across many types of data, but if you're building a tool and trying to have an impact in a particular field, there's all the domain expertise that we want to think about, and that'll be the focus for today. And the presentation that I'm going to give is based on work that was done in a collaboration. Uh, Gunnar Schaefer and Michael Perry are here. Bob Doherty could be sitting over here at this table. And it's very nice to be here at Stanford. It's embedded in these groups. Russ is leading an interesting group pertaining to these issues. And Steve Goodman will be speaking later, is also um, got these ideas in, in mind. So the scientific goals of the particular project that I'm going to tell you about is, uh, which we call the Project on Scientific Transparency, POST, uh, is, has two goals, and they're really about science. So uh, I'm a big fan of Amy and Mike and, and all the work that they do, but actually it turns out I'm a scientist. You know? and, and the kinds of things that we do when we design these tools are done in a way to try to help um, specific goals within this, our scientific enterprise. And the first one really is reproducible research. And the notion of reproducible research is something I'll spend a little time on here. It's a little different from replication and so forth, but I'll spend some time on that. And the second goal that I'll go to in the second part of the talk is something that we call personalized neuroscience, uh, or which is similar to a notion of personalized medicine that's become quite important broadly. And that's really uh, how, we're gonna or how I'm going to organize things. So first off, neuroscience and neuroimaging in particular has entered an era of big science in which, in fact, replication replication is often impractical. You could see that in Christine's talk, um, how many of you want to go build another Sloan data set and survey the sky? I mean, you know, you, so it's not the case in, in the old uh, days if somebody would write a paper and you could look at the method section, you'd go do it yourself in the lab. That's just not going to happen. And that kind of thing happens all the time in neuroscience these days, and that's what I mean by entering the era of big, uh, big data neuroscience. So for example, uh, we have colleagues up at Davis who have analyzed 320 subjects, over 650 scans, over three time points, over four years, and taken MRI measurements of them and, and characterized them in terms of autism and so forth. And the idea that some professor would give a graduate student that paper and say, go, replicate this. Is a, is a bunch of, it's just not going to happen. On the other hand, the data are really valuable. And uh, so that's, so we're not going to replicate it, but we're going to have to do something else to build trust in science here. Uh, a second one is, is a kind of favorite of mine is, uh, in fact, some colleagues of mine flew down to Colombia and South America and found uh, some people who had grown up uh, born to FARC uh, rebels, and they had never gone to school. And they go, went and they took these people and they brought some of them to Caracas and some of them to London and they scanned them for MR and so forth. And I'm telling you, I'm not going down there anytime soon to go collect up some more FARC rebels. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Now, so what I've, what I've been telling you is that um, replication, which in, in my understanding means obtaining the data again, usually by independent investigators using similar methods, equipment, and protocols, uh, that, that's a problematic for us in this era of big science. But reproducible means something else. It means that starting with the data gathered by the scientists, we can confirm the derived results, for example, the, statisti the statistics, the summary curves, uh, images, numerical relationships, and so forth. And, and that, that's what we, uh, that, that seems within reach. That seems something like, so, that's something we can actually do. And uh, we're kind of practical people over here in the Neurosciences Institute, and so uh, I know there are many things we can't do, but let's try to do the ones, the thing that we can do. 
And I think reproducibility is really within our grasp. And, and I have been, uh, so this guy, Donahoe, is known to some of you as my cousin. He's also uh, in the stat statistics department here. And uh, he's been doing this kind of stuff for a long time. And uh, I've been very uh, motivated by Dave and, and his thinking on this. And, uh, and his whole field. Now, they, they don't even really collect, I don't know if you know that many statisticians, but they don't really collect data that, ordinar that ordinarily. They kind of use other people's data, so this reproducible thing is important to them. And they uh, put their reproducible methods, if, if, Dave, if you're in Dave's lab, you put your reproducible methods in your paper. And that means sharing your um, code and, and whatever the original data were that you, that you ran on. And he writes, as you've, you've probably read by now, that computational reproducibility, he's a statistician, is not an afterthought. It's something that must be designed into a project from the beginning. And then he notes, one does need to develop a whole set of programming and research disciplines. And programming tools, I think I would say, this is kind of a set of software. Uh, and a research discipline means the way you ask your graduate students to behave during the performance of the, of the project. Like you behave, your postdocs behave, and so forth. What are you thinking from the very beginning? And you need to stick with it, because there's always, ah, I'll get to it next week, or something like that. No, 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 don't, don't wait. Do it now. And uh, keep the uh, end result in mind that you're going to be producing reproducible uh, papers and, and research, and stick with it. OK, so what does that mean? So we use the phrase. Uh, that reproducible research requires scientific data management tools. So SDM is something you'll see me say uh, a lot in this talk, SDM, scientific data management tools. That, that's, you know, from my point of view, that's the, the best use of computers in our research is to make sure that we're managing, analyzing our data carefully and properly. And, and these should be expected part of any important scientific experiment. That's Dave's point. Start at the beginning, hold to it. And the research, the reproducible research tools really, for those to work effectively, have to help with data sharing and also computational sharing. Both of those are really important. OK, so that's one thing. And I will tell you uh, in, a, in a few moments after I do this next little bit, I will tell you about the tools that we've built uh, to do that and how they try to meet those, uh, meet those objectives. Okay, But hold those objectives in mind. The second thing that I'm going to tell you about is that when you have tools like that, it can help you think about different ways to perform the science that we do uh, in a way that uh, expands on the range of experiments. And there's really an opportunity that derives from the, comp from the combination of big science and this interest in reproducible research. I'm going to describe it to you briefly here, and just to give you a little bit of the domain. Uh, so the domain I'm going to, it doesn't, it, the domain I'm going to um, provide this in is uh, understanding these connections in the human brain. Uh, the, the gray stuff at the edge is the cortex is the, of the brain. And the uh, long white uh, fibers that you're seeing are the axons that come from cortex, different parts of the brain. And there are many of these connections. And these connections aren't passive. They change during the lifespan as children grow up. As you learn something, they change. They, get, they wrap with different um, oligodendrocytes, a kind of cell. And so it's a system with very active wires is what your brain is. And I, I now want to kind of bring together the study of that kind of structure in the brain. It's a structure uh, with um, the, the practice of the science or the practice of the clinical medicine or the practice of uh, uh, personalized neuroscience. So imagine that a subject, a particular individual, comes to you and they have a retinal eye disease or some kind of a problem and into the lab, and you want to know what the consequences of that eye disease are for retinal, uh, the, of the retinal degeneration for these fibers that are sitting behind them. So the retina is sending its output onto these fibers. The retinal output goes onto those little purple ones over there, and then uh, goes to these purple ones over here. And then uh, up, that, that's called the optic track, and then up here to the optic radiation of primary visual cortex. And uh, so we take this subject, this one person, and we put them in an MR scanner. And we go find the tracks for that one person, because that's the person we're interested in. We're interested in the health of that individual. And we measure it. And I'm not going to describe to you the physics of this particular measurement, but this is a measurement basically that tells us something about the health of that track. It's one of many measures that we can make. And, and what's shown by blue and red and so forth are the variation of that measure along the, along the track. And by health, I don't mean that everything has to have the same color. 
But um, I, I do mean that it, it's a measure of the tissue properties of that trine. And of course, you'd want to use that using computational tools for quality assurance that your data were actually good. And you'd want to use open source software so that other doctors or other scientists could check that what you did was uh, the same thing as what they think you did, and that they might be able to use it themselves on their own subjects and so forth. So we're starting to get back to the tools. And then say, so, well, now I've got this one subject, but I wonder what the typical subject looks like. Well, again, you need tools for data management. Say, well, can you find me 500 other subjects from around the world who are measured in the same way that I might compare? Or at least at my center, could I find these? And in fact, if you look from here, this part to here, to this part, and you draw the curve, that's the mean of a, a couple of hundred subjects. That's the distribution, the uh, two standard deviation line, one two standard deviation curves around it. And I can take this particular subject that I'm describing to you who had Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And you can see that for this particular individual, this particular part of the track is off the distribution. Now, to do that, I needed to have access somehow in a data repository to, all, to the standard, to the growth curves. Somebody needed to collect that and make that available. And I might want to compare that person to somebody of a similar age. So it's not like there's one curve. I might want to find for that person and all others of the same age, which is changes across the lifespan. Or I might want to find it for that person in North America versus Asia, because these might change also. So I need some way to specify what my control and comparison group is, and I like to automate that. So you can see how this goal of doing this kind of analysis interacts uh, with these tools. And not only that, you'd, you'd like to do it for more than one person uh, without the expectation that they're all going to be the same. So it might be the case that everybody's with Liebers is the same except for noise. But this is a hereditary disease whose onset starts at different times in life and has different conditions. And I don't really think as a scientist that they're all going to be the same. I might measure them at different times. The onset might have been different times. So I really want to be able to look at each one across uh, with respect to the expectations for the normal population. And you can see some of the ones shown here in blue are within the control distribution and some are way out. And for me, this is, uh, I'll tell you, uh, uh, anyway, this is actually a practical matter for me. OK. So I'm now giving you two things to think about. One is the notion that we'd like to build tools for reproducible research. That is, uh, when somebody goes and collects a data set and they're willing to share it with me, I, I could run their tools. I could re reuse the data, as Chris was saying, or run their tools, or share my tools with them, and so forth. I'd like to do that. And if I could do that and keep track of the data and the tools, I'd have this kind of big opening so that I don't, I, I could use individual subjects and compare them against the health and properties of controls from uh, other places. So that's what the software that Gunnar, Michael, Bob, and I have been working on are aimed at helping with. It's that, those scientific goals. That's really what we're about. And so we did this technology development uh, to improve this uh, trust and reproducibility of human brain imaging studies. I, I'm, I hope it'll help in other places, but we've got one example for one place here. And the goal really is just to reduce the barriers to data sharing and computation. So how, what did we do? So these, uh, this SDM, as we call it, uh, is used from the very beginning. When a, when a kid comes into my lab and goes to collect data in the scanner, the first move is that the data uh, at the scanner, without asking them, are put into a database. It just goes into a database automatically from the scanner. We don't wait until the end. Uh, you do it from the beginning. And the tools that Gunnar, Bob uh, have worked on are tools for uh, making it really simple for that kid to share his data with somebody else. And in fact, we'd like to make it really simple. So get out your checkbook, Mike. We'd like to make it really simple to, uh, to share these data with the uh, digital repositories when we're done. At the end, when the thing is published, there should be one click. And without a lot of work, off you go. And it would be shared broadly. So you have to make user rights management as an issue for you, as opposed to saying, I'm not going to worry about user rights. Everybody takes it all the time. Worry about user rights. That seems OK. Uh, also, to find these data, I was saying it for my goal of personal, uh, personalized medicine, to find the data, I need to be able to search. I need to be able to look both in my own house and hopefully at other places and go find those matching sets. So, so searchable. That's good. OK. Uh, we have the same set of requirements, I'll go quickly, for code sharing. 
not just for the data sharing, but for the computational part of it. I start out with Donahoe, I'm still with them on it. And uh, the thing, uh, I mean, Chris asked this question, it actually seems really important to me about, and, and somebody else also, about, well, why would people do this? So in our center, the reason they do it is, first off, they have no choice, because we ran the center and we set it up that way, so end of story on that. But second, uh, they don't complain about it. In fact, they, they're, it's okay, because we do lots of stuff as part of the data gathering process that they're happy to have. We archive the data, we check the quality, uh, we give them simple visualizations, we run it in a way that's platform independent, we do stuff so that you come here, you come to the center and say, oh, that's pretty good, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff, and then they're already into the system and they're not, they're not moaning about it, about stuff they have to do. So I'm now just gonna quickly run through this. Data from the scanner, immediately parsed, stored in a permanent database, it works on multiple platforms. I should say that the design, uh, our, Gunnar was the software architect for the, for the general system. The design of it uh, centers around a RESTful um, API that's at the middle of all this, so that the data from the scanner automatically reaped and placed in a database. Uh, the uh, user interacts with the data to download it or to do simple processing uh, through a web interface. So people are used to bringing up their browser and searching for, on YouTube for cat videos, and they can do this too. And, and that's the user management piece. Now each lab has uh, the ability by a web interface to select who has access to the data. So we don't ask you at the first moment when you've collected that first fresh data set to say, oh, here it is, share it. We say, yeah, that can happen later when you're ready. But you have access, but if you want to collaborate with somebody, Go for it. You, it should be really easy, no barrier to that. Uh, you can collaborate at different levels of resolution. You can collaborate with your entire project, or maybe you just want this data set to be checked by the um, team in radiology to see if this particular individual had an unwanted lesion or something. So you can, at, at, at arbitrary levels of granularity, and uh, we also, Gunnar architected it in a way that it can be shared across multiple institutions. And, and this is just what how, what sharing means, it just open this thing, this thing up, change permissions, and set somebody's name in there, and off you go. The last part, which is what we've been focused on for the last six months, and we hope to complete the first uh, dis distribution. Of so this code is being run, I'll tell you about that in, in a bit, but the part that's not yet complete, but that's our current focus and passion, is the processing part, which is something that Russ and his team and we, we have in common. Um, it, which is that the data can be analyzed uh, by shared methods, but that you don't have to use somebody else's methods to go and uh, analyze your data. You can choose your own methods. You can, sh you can share them, and you can share methods with others, but we can't have somebody go and tell you, this is the way you have to do it, or else you know, you're, you're a lightweight loser and never get published in this journal. That's not, that's not, we're not after that. We're after making it easy. Okay, so Michael uh, has set up this whole environment that's got in, get, that has started the processing uh, pipeline for us and that we're using this, which is linked in with the uh, database now and that uh, we're starting to integrate more and more completely. And the idea is that given uh, access to the system and resources for how many people can use it and so forth is an issue for us. Uh, but given access to the system, perhaps we're collaborating in some way, uh, you can take your data set and you can drag them onto a web browser. They will be anonymized, uploaded, and processed using one of a series of specific tools that are available. And uh, that might take half a day, actually. Some of these analyses are, are, are a bit complex. And they are returned to you in the form of a web page uh, that contains both the results uh, and also the, um, that, that contains, I'm sorry, the, the results as well as the um, code that was used to generate those results. And after two and a half years, uh, we've had about 500 postdocs, graduate students, PIs use this. There's been about 8,500 scan sessions. A scan session means you go take a person, put them in the scanner for an hour and then send them home, a couple of thousand, 6,000 subjects, 64 research groups, and there's a whole bunch of data. To put this, these numbers in context, one of my favorite projects, and I think was well worth it, was, is the Human Connectome Project, which was a $40 million project 
that um, collected 1,200 data sets of various types on people. It's very thoroughly curated and very nicely done and managed by a group at Wash U. Uh, this project here is just kind of what happens uh, if you build in the tools and start putting them in, in the center. You don't have to put the 40 million in here. It's different. That one, that one has different goals. But I just want to give you a sense of the scope and rate at which these things, uh, these things can arise. And finally, let me just say that the technology components in the current release, I've told you about the instruments. There's multiple instruments, database, and so forth. The instruments are GE or Siemens. Uh, the file system uh, underlying this in, in our hands, it doesn't have to be this way, but is OpenZFS, the MongoDB database, uh, the JavaScript tools and libraries that are being used for the user interactions are AngularJS and, and HTML5. And the processing engine and almost all the underlying API and code and so forth, uh, Gunnar won't touch anything except Python, and it's all in Python. And there you have it. Uh, and it's open source. Uh, and I would say that uh, everything that has, and we're committed, Gunnar, Michael, Bob, and I, we're committed that everything that touches the data or analyzes the data or manages the data has to be open source. That's a, that's a really firm commitment on our parts. Uh, and then as an example, uh, there are other things that you might do, for example, uploading to the digital repository. I don't know that that has to be open source. It, you know, if anything, that, that, that's just stuff. But, any, but anything having to do with the science really has to be. So that was, I just showed you a picture of a, um, uh, I just, sorry, I just showed you a picture of a particular track just to show all these tools that work in a particular example. Uh, we have at our site for that particular fiber track, which has to, has to do with uh, communicating between the back and the front of the brain. Um, we have a large collection of data that have been assembled uh, for a variety of tracks, and they're all listed here and published in, uh, by a, in a piece led by Jason Yateman and Aviv Mazur. And uh, we can compare that track. We can now upload data from a patient, and we can make comparisons for that track and for many of the other tracks uh, that are shown over here. So there's a variety of these tracks, and they're listed along this axis here. And the green is the data point for that particular individual, and the bars are where that individual stands with respect to the group norms. And you can see that's the sort of tool that we use for both reproducibility and for personalized, uh, and for personalized science. So let me, this is now the last slide, and let me just conclude with our hopes and fears. Um, our fears are really, it's something Christine spoke about also, which is the, the notion of sustainability. Boy, you know, you do one of these projects, you set it into the open source community, what, you know, you set it out there, you do it, you get the funding for a while, the funding stops, uh, you know, I'm hoping to retire someday, that'd be nice. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't know how you do that. Another, another quite specific one is, you know, I'm looking at all these, I, I know a couple of the folks around here who are high-end programmers, and I know what we pay them, and I know what they could get paid if they walked down the street to Apple or Google or something, and uh, that's, a, a real serious, that's a real serious issue for doing projects like this in the academic context, and NSF isn't gonna pay those salaries. Um, and then, uh, so what's the plan? And a lot of people look at me, and they say, so what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And that's what I'm doing. I'm saying, what's Russ going to do? Because I'm going to let him, uh, he's a young man. Uh, and and uh, we have, really, I'm doing anything that will keep this thing going. I'm ready. One is to go open source. One is to have uh, foundation support. Uh, and another one, and this is a conflict of interest that I'm now uh, um, sharing with you. Uh, it's a rather modest one, but nonetheless. Uh, which is that I'm, I'm happy if a commercial venture wants to take this on and one of them has picked it up. It's called Flywheel Exchange, and, and I have a, um, an investment in them. Uh, and, they, and they think that they can take this stuff and they can sustain it by making money on it. I'm an American. I'm okay with capitalism. No problem there. And, and so any, anything, any, I want this reproducible research thing to work. I'm okay with that, however it works. And uh, so we're, we're doing what we can to support all of those. And I will show up at your meetings, and I will show up at your meetings, and I'll show up at their meetings, and whatever it takes. I really want that, that thing to work. So scientific data management tools really are needed to support re reproducible research in this area of big science. We understand enough to be able to do it in the context of neuroimaging. Uh, 
Uh, I, I really wouldn't pretend to know enough about many of the other fields that came up here in molecular biology and in other cases. We did feel that the domain expertise we had was valuable here. Uh, we've made a start uh, with this one product. We think if we learn how to do it well in this context, we may be of value to other people who would like to do it in other contexts. We feel we've benefited. I would say that the astronomy community have been real leaders in this, and we feel we, we're always going to those folks and asking for advice about how to do this kind of thing. And I don't think that the barriers are technical. Uh, they're a little bit financial, a little bit social, a little bit these issues about you know, who wants to share and so forth. They're actually, a lot of it's a, a social thing, so it's a good thing for psychologists to work on. And uh, I hope you'll uh, all help us continue moving this. And I really want to gratefully acknowledge the Simons Foundation, the Weston Havens Foundation, which have been tremendous in helping us uh, launch this project. Thanks for your attention. Hi. Uh, it's really exciting the turnaround time you have with getting that data out of the scanner and into a database and shareable. What I'm curious about is the curation process, because I always think of a curation process as being sort of you know, some TLC from a, a motivated librarian. So in this process, is the data automatically, is there metadata coming from the scanner, or is there also more human intervention in that process? One of the nice things about medical imaging data is that they come out in a format that was agreed upon, uh, these DICOM file formats that were agreed upon. They have massive amounts of header that provide you um, certain kinds uh, of uh, metadata about the measurement itself. And all those, uh, so Gunner and, and, the, and the group grabs all that data, uh, puts it in the database to make that part of it searchable. There are other little rules about subjects and so forth, details that I didn't tell you about that, that we have to worry about PHI, uh, health, health, private health information. Um, and then uh, I, I guess I'm not, and, and for structural data, which is the one I was emphasizing here, there isn't a lot to say about things such as, um, you know, the task, because there's no task. Uh, but the, uh, you might need to know things about the subject's health status or conditions that make the data valuable. And those are not under our control in this system. Those are things that you need to write forms for, where, so there's slots to write those forms. You can upload uh, attachments to the data sets. For example, if somebody did a behavioral test, that can be uploaded and attached and stored in the database. And I think that's the curation part that you're probably worrying about. And we do the part that we can that's under our control, and then we really hope that people are doing the other parts. Is that okay? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.